When the British medical journal The Lancet published a study suggesting that more than 650,000 people had died as a result of the war in Iraq, Prime Minister John Howard dismissed the figures out of hand. Mr Howard said it was an unbelievably large number, out of whack with most other estimates, and he said it was not plausible because it wasn't based on anything other than a house-to-house survey. British Prime Minister Tony Blair and US President George Bush voiced similar views, and some scientists have also attacked the study's methodology. So how was the study carried out, and how robust are its findings? It was carried out by a team at John Hopkins University in the United States, and one of the authors was epidemiologist Dr Les Roberts, who now teaches at Columbia University. Les Roberts, welcome to The National Interest. Peter, it's nice to be with you. Now, what did your research actually find? Many of us have probably heard the headline figure of 650,000 additional deaths. But tell us what the study actually found. We went to, we tried to go to 50 neighborhoods across all of Iraq. We couldn't make it to three of them. And each time we got to a neighborhood, we picked a house completely at random uh, within that city or village or rural area and interviewed it and the next 39 houses closest. So we always went to clumps of 40 houses and said, who lived here on the 1st of January, 2002? Who lives here today? Has anyone been born in between? Has anyone died in between? And if someone died, then we sort of asked some follow-up questions. What did they die of? What months did they die? How did they die? If it was a violent death, we asked for the circumstances and who had killed them. And by measuring the rate of births and deaths for a year and a little before the invasion and for three years after the invasion, we were able to compare the death rates. And by subtracting out the baseline from before, we came to the conclusion that about 650,000 people, and that's an estimate, it could be anywhere between 400,000 and 900,000, but Probably it's in the ballpark of 650,000 people had died above the rate that people were dying during Saddam's last year. And the important part for our story is that more than 90% of those, probably 600,000 of those deaths, appeared to be from violence. So almost all of the raised mortality that we documented in these almost 2,000 homes in Iraq was associated with violence. And what were the main causes of those violent deaths? By far, the main cause was people being shot, and probably primarily by Iraqis shooting Iraqis. The first question that occurs, of course, is how good is that as a sample? You talked about 50 regions and 40 households in each region. How good is that in terms of sample size? There's been a lot of work over the past 30, 40 years trying to figure out if you're doing a survey in Australia or even just a province of Australia, how many different places do you need to go to in order to sort of capture a reasonable image of the experience? And the answer is going to 30 places usually provides a pretty robust description of a population if those 30 individual places were all truly picked at random. And so we went to 50. We went to 50 because the first time around when we only went to 30, there was one place, the city of Fallujah, that had just been devastated by shelling and bombing. And it was so far out of whack with all the others that it it made our confidence intervals very, very wide. This is a previous previous study you did which came up with the figure of 100,000 deaths, I think, a year after the invasion of Iraq. That's correct. It came out, it was a study done in September 2004, saying we thought at least 100,000 people had died above the rate of death in the last year of Saddam's time then. Uh, and, And now we're saying it has gotten far, far worse. Well, look, there has been a lot of criticism of your survey, and I'll run through some of those criticisms with you. First of all, uh, Madeleine Hicks, who's a public health researcher at King's College in London, says she can't believe the claim that your survey teams interviewed 40 households per day, saying it's simply not enough time to do that kind of in-depth research, to do 40 households in a single day. (laughs) Well, she's she's simply not correct on this. Uh, I have done, I tallied them up the other day, 
50-something surveys, almost all cluster surveys and mostly mortality surveys since 1990. In most of them, when I'm planning and budgeting, I expect one interviewer to do 20 interviews a day. That's sort of the norm. It was quite a bit slower in Iraq. When I was there in 2004 doing this, it took two interviewers, typically about three hours, to do a 30-house cluster. So we had two teams operating. Each team could easily, easily do a 40-house cluster in a day. So she's simply not right. And uh, Well, look, let me point out one other thing to our listeners, and that's that you didn't actually do these interviews, did you? I mean, this was done, survey was done more or less by remote control from outside Iraq. So the first time around, I went, and I did accompany the interviewers. But this time around, it was felt that things were so tense and so bad, our going wouldn't add anything. The main fellow we worked with, uh, former assistant dean of the medical school there in Baghdad, is a really, really sharp guy. And after we had done it together once, um, there was not really any need for us to go. So that's right. We did a lot of email and phone support. We went and met in Jordan before the start of the study and did all the planning. And then when all was said and done, they came back with the data forms and we entered and analyzed the data. But who actually did the, the question asking? Who actually knocked on the doors? A, a group of Iraqi doctors led by our colleague in Iraq, a professor at El Mustansadiyah University. Another criticism of the method is that your survey suffers from what's called a main street bias, that uh, in selecting households, your teams moved outwards from the center of towns where the majority of violence is likely to occur, and so it's therefore an unrepresentative sample. Yeah, I, I heard this. It's coming from a couple of physicists at Oxford, and I just simply think it's not true. Every time you do a survey like this, there is the possibility that biases creep in, but this one almost certainly isn't possible. And I say that for a couple of reasons. First of all, when we picked a house on a randomly picked street, we almost always ended up two or three blocks away to get to the 40th house. So the one that was picked was not the majority of houses in any given cluster. That's number one. Number two, we had an equal chance of picking a main street as a back street. And number three, the vast majority of deaths are violence. The vast majority are adult males. And it seems, we didn't actually collect this information, but when bouncing this Main Street bias idea off of the doctors who did the work, they said that the vast majority of the deaths happened when people were away from their homes, in markets, standing in queues, walking on the streets, going back home. So... It just doesn't fly. You're listening to The National Interest, and I'm speaking to epidemiologist Dr. Les Roberts, one of the authors of research recently published in the British medical journal The Lancet, indicating that 650,000 extra deaths have occurred in Iraq since the invasion.